to do daily recitation of high quality of memorized language. No one ever regrets having memorized something. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Well, Andrew, Happy New Year. Yes, 2021 is finally here. Yes, and as our listeners know, we started part one of our Your Nurturing Competent Communicators talk, now adapted for our podcast at the very end of 2020. So here we are into 2021. Well, and I hope many people who didn't have the habit of reading to their kids Mm -hmm. or people who once had it but kind of got caught up with the busyness of whatever, the holidays. Let's have a New Year's resolution. Agreed. Since we don't generally do that anymore. (laughs) I mean, I gave up on that kind of thing long ago. I like to set goals rather than resolutions. They sound like more achievable. I don't even like goals. (laughs) But, you know, how about, you know, the idea of a renewal, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a renewed effort at reading to the whole family. Right. And just make it a priority. Right. You know, make it a priority. And who knows whether um, kids will be back to school everywhere all the time sure. this year. Yeah. Or whether there will still be many people who have their kids at home. Right. Uh, doing remote learning, whatever. And that's a that's a kind of an opportunity. Exactly. Um, you know, for some, it's definitely a, a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is an opportunity to have more time with kids. Mm -hmm. And I strongly hope that everyone will use that opportunity to read. And and it's it's amazing. You know, it'd be great to sit down and read for a whole hour. But that's hard. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard for the reader sometimes Mm -hmm. to keep going. Mm -hmm. It's hard to not have interruptions. Mm -hmm. But you know what? 15 minutes once or twice a day. Right is still a very significant amount of time. And you can knock off a lot of literature, even in small chunks. Yep. In fact, I will confess that I fell into a bad habit last year, Uh-oh. listening to the radio while I was driving. <laughs> and what I noticed is that listening to NPR made me more depressed. So then I would go to some other kind of station I, I don't like most of the music, so it's all talk. Mm-hmm. And then, then that would also make me depressed, only with commercials. <laughs> so then I would go back to NPR to get my daily dose of depression um, <laughs> without commercials. And I thought, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it was affecting my spirit. Mm. And so I thought, well, I'm, I get, I've got to go back to my old habit, mm-hmm. which is – Audiobooks. Exactly. I just have to go that extra little step to connect my phone to the mm-hmm. car, <laughs> and then I can listen. But my, my commute is 12 and a half minutes. Right. <laughs> so it's not, it doesn't seem quite worth it unless I have to go further if there's traffic. But you know what? 12 minutes twice a day mm-hmm. is 24 minutes, mm-hmm. and you can get through a, a whole five, six hour book mm-hmm. in, a, in a few weeks. Mm hmm. At, at the most. Right. And then if I have a longer trip or something, you know. So I'm back on board. Oh, good, Andrew. With, with listening to positive, powerful, nurturing literature and, and also nonfiction. Mm-hmm. And so I, I have to say e- even a little bit every day consistently can make a huge difference. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of – Education journals that I subs- subscribe to, you know, they, they're they expressing best practices for virtual learning. And there's another piece of it that talks about, oh, my goodness, the, these students in school right now, what's going to happen that they're not 
in a classroom with their stu- their teachers every day. And, you know, I, too, am just wondering what's going to happen with these kids. And I just – what you were sharing just now just gave me hope, Andrew, that if parents and other busy adults, as you talked about last week, were actually dedicated to spending 15, 20 minutes a day, that's all it takes to read out loud to their children while they're in these virtual classrooms – we could actually transform the educational system just by doing that very thing. I, I think that is absolutely the key to gaining literacy in America is parents reading out loud to children. There you it, go. Restoring that culture. Part two yes. of Nurturing Competent Communicators is something we have talked about in the past. I think we touch on it almost every single podcast says it's so important. Well, and and it's something that is so neglected, Mm -hmm. more today than perhaps any other time in history. Mm. And that is the cultivation of language skills through memorized language. Yep. And there's so many directions, you Mm -hmm. know, we could go with this. I think we did a two-part podcast just on memory Mm -hmm. and talking about all of the neurological and physiological aspects of yes. memorizing. And you talked about, you know, placing things in a room and almost like a mind palace thing to help you remember things and some mnemonics. And right. That and was a great podcast. Techniques of memory. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's something people can look at past podcasts. Mm-hmm. The, the most interesting aspect of it for me, however, is the way in which memorized language creates patterns or templates that are then available for use mm-hmm. in writing or speaking. And I, I stumbled into an awareness of this many, many years. I could almost say many decades, but that might make people think I'm older than I really am. <laughs> but I went and lived in Japan mm-hmm. for three years when I was 21, 22, I guess. I went when I was 22. And I... Uh, I was studying with Dr. Suzuki of Suzuki Method, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, some people know as Talent Education or uh, his book Ability Development from Age Zero, in, in preparation to become a full-time Suzuki violin teacher. That was my my goal. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, I was interested in a lot of things that distracted me <laughs> from what I was supposed to be doing, which what, was you were 21? <laughs> practicing my violin six hours a day. Uh, and one of the things that really caught my interest was learning Japanese. I had done uh, a little bit of high school Latin, but, you know, you pretty much don't learn a language in high mm-hmm. school, even if you take a couple years of classes. Four years of Spanish for me, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you wouldn't want to be uh, alone in the streets of Mexico? Um, I don't think I would survive. <laughs> I could ask where the bathroom is yeah. or where I can, you know, buy some food. <laughs> yeah. So I went to Japan and it was a completely different language, different, you know, different writing, different sounds, mm-hmm. very different. And so out of necessity, I started to pick up some sure. things and I got more interested and so then I got a Japanese teacher to teach me Japanese. He was actually a high school English teacher. Oh, interesting. And so he could communicate decently well with me in English, and he could teach me Japanese stuff. But I, I also realized that in order to learn this, I was going to have to learn to read. And I had a very hard time learning to read until I realized that I needed to write the characters. Oh, okay. And as soon as I started to write the the different alphabet, the mm-hmm. kana systems, there's two of them, mm-hmm. and then I started and I learned the kanji, the Chinese characters that are used in Japanese. I started with just like first grade characters, which are all pretty cool because they look like something. Mm-hmm. You know, a big looks big and a river looks like a river and a dog looks like a little thing next to a big thing. And and there's a, a almost a charming logic to pictographs. And then mm-hmm. it does get more complex. And so I I spent probably an hour to an hour and a half every day for a year and a half studying how to read and write the Japanese language. And, of course, that's convenient. And you see a sign, you know probably what that is. 
and then pretty soon you know what everything is. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm living with Japanese people, in school with Japanese people, spending all my spare time teaching English to Japanese people who I have to talk with. Mm -hmm. and, and I hit this wall after about a year and a half. I knew all the words I needed to know to say anything that I wanted to say. And I knew all the rules of Japanese grammar. And so I could always construct a sentence that basically communicated what I wanted to communicate as long as people were patient and would be willing to listen to my funny accent or whatever. <laughs> but I, I didn't have the fluency, the mm. ease, and I wasn't sure what to do. I could learn more words. I could keep studying grammar. I hang out with Japanese people all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then I thought, okay, I am a Suzuki Method student, and I was as a child, and then I quit playing for a while, and now I'm in Japan preparing to be a Suzuki Method teacher. And one of the distinctives of Suzuki Method is that children memorize their repertoire, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like you learn a piece and then you perform it and then you forget it. No, you learn a piece, twinkle, twinkle, little star and variations. And once you've learned that, you learn the next piece, lightly row, in the, in the violin repertoire. But you don't stop playing twinkle and variations. Then you learn another piece, right, Song of the Wind, but you don't stop playing lightly row and twinkle. And then you learn another piece, Oh Come Little Children or whatever, but you don't stop playing. And so the children in Japan, they, they do this universally much, much better than in other countries. They never forget a piece of music that they've ever learned. Hmm. They maintain a memorized repertoire. Hmm. And, that's and when you say memorized, you mean they don't have music in front of them. Oh, they're, yeah. They're doing it from memory. From memory. Wow. Well, and the young children are learning by ear. Mm -hmm. They're not learning by looking at notes on mm -hmm. a printed page. In fact, in Japanese, the word for printed music and the word for music are completely different words. Mm, interesting. They're, they're not synonyms at all. Hmm. One is ongaku, which is the sound of music, hmm. and the other one is gakufu, which would be the characters of music. Interesting. Wow. Anyway, so I thought maybe what I should do is memorize some Japanese mm -hmm. language. Yeah. And so I went to the bookstore. It was Jack and the Beanstalk. Okay. I bought it because I kind of already knew the plot. Sure. And it was a children's book with mm -hmm. pictures, but it wasn't a wimpy Jack and the Beanstalk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a couple hundred sentences at least. Mm. And I took it to my Japanese teacher, and I, I said to him, would you please record this book into this tape player, right? Cassette tape. Cassette tape. <laughs> wow. Because I thought, well, if I'm going to memorize it, I want the advantage of being able to hear it mm -hmm. and hear it done well mm -hmm. and correctly. Mm -hmm. And he kind of wondered why I would want to do this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem very useful, although it turned out to be very useful. Mm -hmm. But I just, you know, he did it. And I, so I started. And I, I started learning it the way you would memorize anything. I know you've done some scripture mm -hmm. memory work, and you just say the first sentence again and again and again and again until you don't have to think hard to remember it. And then you add the next sentence, uh, and you say both of those sentences again and again and again until you kind of have an automatic. And then you add the next sentence, and you say all three until that's basically easy, fluent, <gasps> natural. Easy plus one, Andrew. Yeah, it's a universal principle. <laughs> yes, I guess it is. Um, and... And so that's what I did. And it took me a long time. I, I mean, many weeks, maybe months. I don't remember. But I was determined to do it. And I did. I memorized the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And it was tremendously useful in two ways. Number one, I could entertain Japanese children like you would not believe. I'd wow. go to someone's house for dinner and I would just start reciting this story, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I would recite this whole thing. And the kids are just like, wow. They'd never seen anyone who could do this, let alone a big, ugly white guy with a funny <laughs> accent, right? <laughs> right? But the second thing I noticed was that I would be able to use a phrase or a clause or a 
a part of a sentence or even a, a whole sentence mm-hmm. and change the words. Mm-hmm. I could change the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives or the articles or anything that needed to be changed. And I could say what I wanted to say in a grammatical pattern that I could realize was probably correct, Mm -hmm. but not something I ever would have been able to construct simply by using the rules of Japanese grammar Mm -hmm. in a more artistic way. Do you see? Yeah. And so it was was a breakthrough. And I noticed these little bits of Jack and the Beanstalk coming out of my mouth in a mutated form, Mm -hmm. but accomplishing a higher level of fluency. And uh, years later, I came to know that the way the military language school Hmm. operates is very different than the way the high school language classroom operates. Interesting. And so if you're going to go to the Middle East and you you take a six-month intensive on Farsi, Mm -hmm. essentially what is done is memorized dialogues. Mm -hmm. And they have constructed these memorized dialogues to include most of the vocabulary that you need to be competent. Of course, they're spending, you know, six hours a day doing this. So it's a very intensive thing. But it's not it's not like here's your list of vocabulary words and here's your grammar and here's all this. No. Memorize these complete patterns. Mm -hmm. And then the combination of permutation of those is what gives a greater level of fluency. Right. So I'm compelled to ask essentially two questions. One, for the English language learner, Would memorizing large parts of a story or poetry, what we talked about, would that help them break through some of this? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I was in uh, Washington State Mm -hmm. working for a school district that had a very high percentage of students who were Hispanic, mostly migrant migrant agriculture Mm -hmm. workers. So high turnover in the schools, Mm -hmm. about 80 percent of the schools were and so it's a, a difficult, a challenging teaching environment. Sure. And uh, I had done a lot of work with this school district and trained pretty much all their elementary teachers. Mm-hmm. And I went back, you know, because I was living in Idaho at the time. So I went back there to Pasco, Washington, once or twice a year for many years. And I was doing a demonstration class uh, with a little fifth grade called a set, Spanish-English transition. Mm-hmm. So they're not at the lowest level of English, but they're still not fully competent mm-hmm. to study everything in English. Mm-hmm. And so I did a little keyword outline with them. And then I said, okay, now I'm going to give you some homework. My intention was to have them take the keyword outline and go to a family member or a friend and try to tell back the content right. using the keyword outline. Classic unit one assignment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't do it in class because I out of time. But mm-hmm. anyway. But as soon as I said the word homework, mm-hmm. the entire class in unison started to recite the Jack Prelutsky poem. Homework, oh, homework, I hate you, you stink. I wish I could wash you right down the sink. Oh, homework, oh, homework, you're giving me fits. If I had a bomb, I would blow you to bits, something like that. And that's just the first of three stanzas. (laughs) They recited the entire thing. Wow. And first of all, I I was very impressed (laughs) that they all could do it. And, And, of course, such joy. Yeah. Right? But I was also impressed that the teacher knew the value of this. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, Mrs. Ingham has been, you know, she was talking about the importance of poetry memorization for language development. For 70 years, she was preaching right. that message. Right. But this teacher, all on her own. So I asked her afterwards, I said, how did you know the value of doing this? Mm-hmm. And she said, well, you know, I grew up in Puerto Rico and English is not my first language. Mm. And when I uh, came here, I was studying English, but I memorized poems to help build my vocabulary and fluency. Mm -hmm. So she had the exact same experience Mm. kind of by accident, I suppose, or maybe someone suggested it to her that I had in Mm -hmm. Japan memorizing the, the children's you know, fairy tale. Right. That's great. Uh, So I would strongly recommend for anyone trying to learn any language Mm -hmm. that memorizing pieces of of high quality poetry or prose Mm -hmm. 
And of course, you know, my favorite story is about uh, Frederick Douglass. Yes. Um, most people are familiar with Frederick Douglass from one or more versions of his autobiography. But what I find super fascinating about the man is that he grew up completely illiterate. Um, it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read uh, or really to teach them anything. He was forced to work sometimes in a fairly harsh or abusive situation, mm -hmm. separated from his parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the first 12 years of his life. Yeah. And, and so you would think, wow, I mean, short of being chained in a closet, that is about the worst education environment you could create. Yeah. Right? C complete deprivation. Maybe being chained in a closet would be actually be better. I don't know. Yeah. Probably not because there's, you know, human oh, yeah, sure. interaction yeah. no as, matter what you're doing. As terrible as it was, yeah. Um, but, but then he became, by his 20s, probably the most powerful mm -hmm. speaker of his day. Yeah. And, and I would argue that by the end of his career, he was probably the best orator mm -hmm. that the United States mm -hmm. has ever produced, yep. at least from his time forward. Mm -hmm. You might argue that some of his predecessors, Patrick Henry and mm -hmm. the like, mm -hmm. were superior in some ways. But if you read his speeches today, you think there is no one who can talk like that. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and, and so it kind of raises a very important question, which is how did this man with the worst possible education during the most formative period of his life, right, first right. 12 years, yeah, absolutely. become the greatest orator the country's ever seen? Mm -hmm. Well, we know. We have a glimpse. Mm -hmm. And one of his biographers explained – as he explained, that uh, one of the first possessions he had, one of the first things he bought with his own money uh, was a book mm -hmm. called The Columbian Orator, which is still available in a facsimile copy today. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's also available for free at gutenberg.org. We can check that out. Yeah. Essentially, it was written in 1795, if I am correct. So after the founding of the U.S., but before the 1800s, mm -hmm. but it was a collection of the greatest speeches of history oh, okay. um, that had been spoken in English or translated into English, going all the way back to Cicero mm. and, and all the way up through, uh, I think, Patrick Henry right. and, and everything in between. And, and so he basically said he read this again and again and studied it and memorized most of it. Mm. Wow. So he, he furnished his mind with not just the high level of vocabulary that allows greater thinking, not just with the beauty uh, of the, rhetor the rhetorical beauty of the use of the words and the phrases and the clauses and the sentences, patterns, not just with the schemes and tropes that add to the beauty and impact of the mm -hmm. message, mm -hmm. But with the very seminal ideas of justice yeah. and right and truth. Right. And he was then able to harness that. Uh, he had an incredible knowledge of the Bible. And when you read his speech, uh, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, mm -hmm. you notice these continuous references mm -hmm. to elements of Scripture mm -hmm. as well as elements that many literate people would recognize from the great books and of the past. Right. And so to me, this is one of the strongest arguments that we can make for the value of memorized language. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think for children, it's nice to start with things that kind of capture their imagination, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. meaning story, you know, poems that are fun, mm -hmm. maybe a little humorous or dramatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as they get older, bringing in poems that are perhaps a little more serious or, mm -hmm. or have a philosophical side to them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then supplementing that with excerpts from famous speeches. Right. And anyone who is so inclined would supplement that with uh, scripture from their tradition. <laughs> it also reminds me of the the book The Chosen by Chaim Potok. Hmm. So 
this is uh, two Jewish boys in, in New York in the early 1900s. And uh, one is very orthodox, the other is kind of more modern, and their fathers are both rabbis. And so it's, it's an interesting circ- – I think their fathers are both rabbis. But the picture of how these – in the Jewish tradition, they would memorize huge chunks of the Torah, the books sure. of the law. And they would memorize huge chunks of the Talmud, the commentary mm-hmm. on the Torah. Mm-hmm. And then they would get together and have – these deep theological, philosophical arguments Mm -hmm. using that great storehouse of memorized content. Right. And and the way he paints the picture in this book is you just think, wow, that is an intellect so far beyond where I am or (laughs) or anyone I know today, you know, that that we've lost this tradition. Yeah. And so this is the other New Year's – determination yes. I think we can make. And that is whether it's for ourselves, mm-hmm. but more likely for the children that we teach. Yeah. Let us set up a system, a program to do right. daily recitation of high quality of memorized language. Right. No one ever regrets having memorized something. Yes. Andrew, tell that story about the student who used our poetry memorization program, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and then used it to entertain. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it's years ago now. This woman drove like seven hours to come to my Mm -hmm. seminar. I think it was in Kansas City. And when I found out she had driven that far, I said, well, you really didn't have to do that. I mean, you, you could have invited me to your city or mm-hmm. you could watch it on video. Right. She goes, well, I already saw your seminar. I just wanted to tell you something. Mm. I'm like, well, you could have called too. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I had kind of a feeling of guilt mm. that she drove so far. Yeah. So anyway, what she told me, she said, my son is 10 years old and we are halfway through level three okay. of your poetry memorization program. So there's 20 poems per level. So level one, 20, mostly shorter. Level two, 20 more poems, getting longer. Level three, halfway through approximately 10. So this 10-year-old child had 50 poems approximately memorized. And I'm sure that he could probably recite any one of them just on demand. In true Suzuki method style. He was using the program the way it was meant. And she says his favorite privilege is to go to Uh, retirement or assisted care living facilities and recite poetry Mm -hmm. for the people there. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was so beautiful. It almost brought tears to my eyes. I love that, yeah. Um, And and over the past few years, I've had more experience with assisted care facilities. Yes, you and me both. (laughs) And I will tell you, some of the entertainment is pretty awful. Mm. But what a delight, yeah! you know, to have a child like that come in. Yeah. And, and uh, my father-in-law is 90 years old. Mm-hmm. And my son, my my grandson and granddaughter, Aiden and Chaley, who live in Oklahoma here, uh, before the COVID lockdown, they went in and recited poems oh, nice. for him. And he still, you know, almost every time we talk to him, he says... That child, Aww. it's like he had the whole Bible memorized. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Which, yeah. Uh, so there's there's so much opportunity. I mean, it's, it's sure. good for the brain. It's good for the language. It's good for the soul. Right. Because those things which you memorize are more than just in your mind. Right, right. They, they go in. In fact, we have that expression, learn by heart. Yep. Learn it by heart. It becomes second nature. Yep. And – you know, be careful what you memorize because it <laughs> will affect you. Yeah. And and if you don't give children good and beautiful things mm-hmm. to memorize, they'll memorize garbage, mm-hmm. right? So there we go. Well, and you know what, Andrew, it would be really handy for our parents if they knew that there was a resource available to them that had, oh, I don't know, some easy poems for their children to memorize, maybe something a little bit dramatic or humorous, and then going into more sophisticated ones like The Charge of the Light Brigade or Robert Frost Stopping by Wood on a Snowy Evening and some of these other more philosophical ones, all the way up into memorizing 
some of these famous speeches, including excerpts from Frederick Douglass's yeah. What to you a know, Slave. You know, it's funny, when we recorded that level five. So you, you've now said it. Hold oh. on. Well, I haven't said it yet. We actually have that exact product, yeah. of course. It's Everybody linguistic knows. development through poetry memorization. Kitchen and this title. is just a great, great tool. You know, and you can certainly pull together your own resources and work to memorizing them. But I love the fact, Andrew, that you are reading these poems, and so you can put in the CD or listen to the MP3 and just play it a couple times a day. And just like you said, little by little, they will start internalizing those poems. And so using our system, you learn every, you recite every poem that you're working on, easy plus one, every day until you're done with that level. Right. And then the next level you do every poem every other day. Every other poem every other day. There it is. Of yeah. level one, while yeah. you do every poem every day for level two. Yeah. Then when you get to level three, level one goes to every third poem every third day. Level two goes to every other poem every other day, and level three is every poem every day, and then um, you start to run out of time, at which point uh, you put all the poems on a little slip of paper, throw them in a hat or a fishbowl, yep. and pull out as many as you have time for. Once they're all out, throw them all back in. And that way, you never forget something that you have memorized. Yep. Use it or lose it. This principle applies here with memorizing poetry. But I think it's a wonderful system. It's a wonderful way to put in those linguistic patterns into your children's mind. That along with coming up with some titles that you'd like to read, maybe set a goal to read 20 books this year, depending on the ages of your children. You might do easier books, harder books. And of course, we have a book list that we'll link to in the show notes, as well as a link to Sarah McKenzie's wonderful resource of finding books for your children. So what a great way to kick off the new year, Andrew. What 2021 will bring, we will see. Yes. Hopefully, better and more competent communicators. Agreed. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Pudua and the team at IEW, I thank you for allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.